So in the last session of Introduction to Programming, we have seen that you can start grabbing things into memory, reserving things at runtime. This means that as your program is ongoing, you can suddenly reserve a piece of memory, but you have to also free it again. And this is where garbage collection comes into play. Normally, or nowadays, many types of programming languages provide this for you as a service. So when you reserve a piece of memory, um, it automatically detects when you don't need this memory anymore and it deletes this memory for you. Now the tricky thing is it needs, this needs to be done when uh, it is not necessary anymore and there are ways, routines to automatically detect this. But you as a programmer are not in control anymore of exactly when this is happening. That means if you want to predictably uh, see how your program is running, it might be that sometimes it's a bit slower, sometimes it's a bit faster because such garbage collection requires checking but also is then executed at one point in time. So if you have reserved a gigantic amount of memory somewhere, sometimes, uh, at some points, this garbage collection will remove this and you don't really can predict as you are programming when this will happen. So that's why not having garbage collection as it has been up until very recently in C++ is something that is sometimes seen as an advantage or sometimes it's also a disadvantage because you have to have always the memory management of your program in mind. And this is where garbage collection has become so popular. So things uh, or languages like Java and many more meanwhile um, are object-oriented like C++ but also do this garbage collection for you. And also there, this is another layer that happens between you as a programmer and what happens on the lowest layers uh, inside the operating system and on the machine itself. Of course, we have no total control anyway. So we uh, program in C or C++. This is something that we can interpret. And the way our compiler then pre-compiles and then assembles all of that into assembly, into program code that we cannot read anymore, is already um, a little bit uh, of a gray zone. We don't really know what is happening in, the, in those steps, uh, how things are optimized, for instance. And there are also different types of parameters those compilers um, uh, can, can use. Uh, and garbage collection is yet another layer between you as a programmer trying to figure out how something should be done and how the compiler and also the garbage collection within your program is then um, actually working. So uh, the, the, the thing to note here is that some or that many um, languages do have garbage collection and even C++, the latest version of C++ does have garbage collection. Now to make sure that this course is as simple as possible, however, and for many um, environments you still need an older version of C++, we do actually assume that there won't be any garbage collection. And we, I think, also can then convey why it's important to have this memory model that we have seen earlier, uh, why that is so important. The fact that you have um, dynamic heap data um, that is basically, uh, that allows you to reserve pieces of memory on top of the stack that we're already familiar with, and that you have also on top uh, our program code that resides in memory, and the static data which you can reserve statically anywhere in your program. So those pieces of memory and the differences between that memory, I think is very important um, to keep into mind. Okay, so let's go to the next bit then. Um, as soon as I find where we were, which is this here, pointers and arrays. Um, so to remind ourselves, arrays are pieces of memory where you do where you have multiple um, uh, objects or multiple um, instances of a particular variable, for instance, or a particular object. So you have elements that are ordered into an array, which is basically just a sequence of uh, different elements, and you can index those. So if you have an array A, you can use the index, for instance, 4, to access a certain value in that array. It means we use one name, one variable name, and an index, so that we can have multiple 
um, instances of the same type. And we can use, of course, variables as the indices. Now, for an array of size n, you have to also remember that we start at 0 and therefore end at n minus 1 in terms of this index. Um, so if we have three characters, as is seen here, and we name these three characters C, and we can index those, we can index those from 0 all the way to 2. Now we can also not just have characters or integers or booleans uh, like the, the basic types we've already seen. We can already create our own classes by now, and we can say we can uh, create instances of a class cat, um, and we call that my pets. And this is not just one, but this is an array of 42 of those. So in that case, we create in one go 42 pets. Uh, we also seen that if we use um, an array of objects of a type class of a certain class, that the class must have a default constructor. Because this is basically what is called as this constructor, uh, as uh, this array is being called. And if you want to access members, uh, we we'll just do it as before. It's just that this extra thing, this index, needs to be added. But this is something that we can immediately use right now. Now, what we can do, however, and this makes it a little bit more complex, so stay with me for the next couple of minutes is we can have an array of pointers. As we've seen, a pointer is basically something that points to a piece of memory of a certain type. So if we have a pointer that we call family of type cat, we basically have a pointer that points to an instance of a cat. And we can actually have a, an array of those. So in that case, we just define that we have 500 pointers, which we call family, of type cat that point to a cat. And we can initialize those, for instance, by saying um, if we have those pointers in the beginning, we know that those pointers are pointing to random uh, or can be um, uh, pointing to random pieces in memory that are totally not valid. So we can initialize those with the null pointer. This is one thing we can do. Or we can immediately reserve some space and create a cat for us at runtime. So instead of saying we immediately um, have 500 objects of type cat, we create first, somewhere in our program, 500 pointers towards a cat object, which does not exist yet at this point. And then in this for loop over here, which can be much later, we can say that um, we can create uh, an object of type cat. At this moment, we don't have a name for that. And we assign um, what comes back from that uh, to family over here. Now, interesting here is what happens here. The uh, 2 times i plus 1. Um, so this is basically creating cats when, uh, with a constructor, and the constructor, as we've seen, fills in the age of the cat, and the cat is then automatically given a certain variable in such a way that the first cat is of age 1, the second cat is of, of age 3, the, second, uh, the third cat is of age 5, etc. So one by one, we create an object of type cat. It doesn't have a name, so we can't refer to it at, at the moment. But basically, by assigning this to our pointers, we now can address this. And if we then, after a while, don't need these cats anymore, we need to delete those. If we don't do that, then uh, those will reside in memory, the memory will be reserved, and this is something that we cannot access anymore in our program. If you do this constantly, then too much memory will be reserved, and we might run into memory leaks. So also here, one by one, in a for loop, um, we uh, delete those pointers. And if we delete those pointers, the delete um, keyword over here, make sure that this object that was reserved over here is indeed freed from memory. And in the background, we know that uh, this in our memory model is done um, on the heap. So the objects are placed in the heap, whereas the array of pointers is placed in the stack. Now, pointers are very small. Those are basically just showing how um, where in memory uh, that object is. If a cat uh, also, for instance, contains a picture or a movie of several megabytes, 
as part of this uh, instance of type class, then this can be really, really big. But that is done on the heap dynamically. Whereas this, these 500 pointers are much smaller. Those are just pointers to a PC memory. This is something we can do immediately. So in this case, um, we have in our second function, again, a pointer um, uh, to a cat, which we call family. And we here create an array of 500 cats straight away. And to set the age now, because we wanted to set the age um, through the constructor of the cat, this is not possible anymore. Here, automatically the default constructor was called. And we can't give a variable there. It's initialized to zero. So what happens then here in the for loop that follows it is we basically have to by hand and or by the, the, the methods set it to uh, the right age, just as we had in our previous example. What we do in that case afterwards is we delete uh, this array of 500 cats that we created immediately. Now, there's a difference between this function and the previous function. In this case, the array with all the objects is created on the heap um, and, uh, and at runtime. So basically, this is something that is created immediately because there, uh, we used the new uh, keyword. Um, and in that case, we have to add these um, break brackets or braces, square braces, because we have to tell delete that we're not deleting one particular pointer, but we're deleting an array of pointers. And that should be sufficient for delete to really remove all those 500 objects of class cats immediately. Um, right. Um, and this will, dist uh, will call the destructor on all objects on for the cleanup. So basically, this is, these are two alternatives where here um, the array is on the stack, as we call it here, because here we create an array of 500 straight away, whereas here we create an array of 500 objects of uh, type cats with the new keywords, meaning we do this at runtime all in the heap. Then, um, there are different ways of doing this, and we've seen now two parts, but these are another uh, couple of alternatives. So which is which over here? So here we have, um, we call it family one. It is an array of 500 objects of type cats. Once you do this, it will create on the stack 500 cats, uh, or objects of type cats. The second one, here we create a pointer array of 500. So here we create 500 pointers, uh, which we call family2, that all point to um, an object of type cats. Note here that uh, we have 500 pointers, but those cats have not been instantiated yet. And then here we have a pointer that we call a pointer to type cats, which we call family3. And we immediately assign that to an array of 500 objects of type cats. So here in this case, this, um, uh, this is immediately created on the, the heap, just as in the previous example. So this is basically exactly the same as this over here. Now, this is an exercise for home. Um, which I think is quite important to see whether you really understand this. For each of those lines, try to give the syntax to call the method setH for the age of eight years on the cats with index 10. So the 10th, uh, no, the 11th cat of each of those cats that are set here needs to be given the age 8. How would you do that? Now here are examples of how those are really constructed. So as I said, for this last family, family three, we basically create one pointer and create all the objects in the heap. Because it's basically a pointer that points to an array and this array over here is immediately created through this new 
uh, keywords. So we create an array of 500 cat objects straight away. And we have here a pointer in the stack that uh, points to that. For family of two, or family two, we basically have on the stack an array of 500 pointers. Now, once we have this, nothing is created yet. So those pointers eventually, or hopefully, are pointing to an actual created cat. But that's something that is, at this point, not done yet. So we assume that later in the program, we create with a new cat um, uh, statement a cat for each of those pointers. Or we have them pointing to null if those are not, um, not created yet. And the simplest one is basically to create a uh, family of 500 instances of type cat directly on the stack. Right, so these are the three parts. Now this over here is something that you can do when you already know that you're going to have 500 cats and that'll be it. If, however, you don't know yet how many cats you need to create, then these two will be the, the, the statements of choice. You basically create in the stack, so before runtime, um, a particular array or a particular pointer to an array and then you fill these later on in the heap. So let's see how you can set one of those cat objects uh, or where you can change one of those cat objects. And in this case, as I said already, we want the 11th element or the one, the element with iterator uh, 10 or with index 10 um, and we want to access that particular object or that particular cat and set its age to 8 via the method setH. Now for the first one this is rather easy. Um, so there you just have an array of 500 objects of uh, type cat. So you just take the 11th of that by taking um, the index 10 and you call the methods as we've seen already before. So that is fairly simple. If however you have 500 pointers to an object of, cat, uh, of type cat, <clears throat> then we have uh, to use not the, this operator, but this operator over here to access this method. This is because family2 index 10 is not an object of type cat, but a pointer to an object of type cat. As we've seen in that case, we'll have to use this operator over here. As an alternative, we could have used the star and then the dot over here, but this is a nicer way of doing it. And then for the third example, where we create a new cat array uh, with a new keyword and assign that to the pointer family three, we basically have to do exactly what we've done for the first one. So also here, we have an actual array of uh, 500 cats. So the, we access the 11th cat and then get the method set h, or use the method set h. Now in C++ we've already seen <clears throat> that if you have an array, then you, your array is basically a pointer to the entire structure. And since the array starts with the first element, it is also immediately a pointer to the first element of that structure. A little bit more about that later when we see also const pointers. Now, a reference um, is an, uh, another thing that we already use in terms of uh, this ampersand sign, uh, but a reference itself is basically just another way of renaming a value that points to exactly the same, or that holds exactly the same value in memory. So in this example, you have myInt, which is an integer. As soon as you have this statement executed, somewhere in memory, you'll have four bytes assigned for your variable myInt, with a certain uh, value already inside. Now, once you execute this over here, you create a new reference that points or that holds exactly the same value or that um, has exactly the same value as myInt. So instead of having one variable, myInt, that is reserved for a particular memory space, now you have two. You have myRef and myInt. And those two refer to exactly the same variable. If later my int or my ref gets then reassigned, both of them will get reassigned. <clears throat> Here's an example. So in this case, we have our int1 integer. 
we create a my reference or we create a reference to this one and uh, note that as I said here this reference can only be initialized but not reassigned so this over here can be assigned only once while we initialize it um, when we then change the value of int1 and write both of them out you'll see that this will write out 2 times 5 so it will write 5 int1 and it will because it was assigned to int1 and since both of those are variable names pointing to exactly the same memory location also my ref becomes 5 or it will be returning 5. Now what happens however if we have then a second integer which we call in 2 and we assign that the value of 8 and then in a second part we um, assign the value of in 2 to my ref and note that this is not the reference it's basically the variable that uh, is uh, that it was before just as uh, the same as int1 now once we do this over here my ref will become 8 but also, and this is the, the tricky bit, int1 will become 8. Because int1 and my ref are aliases. They're exactly the same um, thing. They're just two different names for the exact entity within the memory. So this we can also, uh, or we will also publish on the Moodle website so you can see for yourself or also implement it yourself. Um, so this reference part is just a way of uh, accessing something that is a little bit like a pointer. Now, the reference is not the same as a pointer, um, as you can see from the way you're using it, um, but it is achieving similar goals with a cleaner syntax. Now, the next thing we're going to see is the call by value versus the call by reference uh, topic. Now, we've already discussed this uh, when we looked at functions and the way we can, for instance, think about swapping two types of integers. So we've seen how it shouldn't be done. So this is the wrong way of doing it, even though it looks pretty good. We have our temporary integer over here. We have our value x and the value y. And we first put the value of x into temp. Then we put the value from y into x. So we overwrite what was in x before. And then what was in x we write them to y. So then you would assume that after this line over here, the values of x and y have been swapped, which is indeed the case. The problem is if you use that in uh, another function, like here in the main function, and you say, I have two integers x and y over here, and I want to swap their values, then as soon as you exit this function over here, x and y still remain 5 and 10. Because what happens when you call this function swap with x and y is it will create two new integers, x and y, and it will copy the values. And as soon as you exit the function, those new created integers that you have here will be destroyed. And this x over here will be completely different from this x over here. Now this is the call by value. So we copy the value and then um, we have a completely different integer than this one over here, even though their names are exactly the same. So the way to do this with pointers is, as we've already seen, um, by adding, uh, by not passing them as an integer, but passing them as a pointer. And whenever you have in a function an argument that is a pointer, you basically pass the exact um, uh, instance that, you that you're talking about. So in that case, you have your integers uh, x and y with a certain value. And when you then swap those integers, you need to pass the reference to x and pass the reference to y. So that you then get here um, the, the pointers that are passed. Now here you do exactly the same, but you're basically changing the values or addressing the referencing um, and therefore getting the values of x and y as before, but once this, this function is, uh, is lost or is, is uh, terminated, x and y, as they have been changing here, have indeed been changed because you didn't copy those values here into new variables. Now, as you pass the exact references to x and to y, 
the exact contents of x and y can be um, manipulated this way. And this swap function will indeed change x and y and swap those values. Now the swap uh, function now works, however, um, as it says also here, the syntax looks a little bit silly. You know, once you see how you should uh, create this function, um, it does not look as nice as it uh, used to look before. And if you want to use swap, you have to also reference this. This is also not the, the nicest thing. If you want to divulge the fact that I want to swap the values of x and y here. So with that, uh, we can do references and turn things around. So in the function definition, we say that we're not passing pointers, but we're passing references. And if that is the case, then we can basically just uh, use swap uh, as we had it before. Basically have two integers uh, where swap can be used. And in that case, from a user perspective, in the main function, you can use swap as before. You don't have to add anything special there, but what happens then is that uh, the values of x and y will be swapped because what is given here is not x as an integer, but the reference to x. And thus, we can now pass the two parameters by reference and not by value. Okay. So this is a very important aspect, and um, this will definitely be uh, a topic in one of the exam questions. So make sure that you, you completely understand this. So when you have call by value, the way we've seen it up until now for functions, we basically get the parameters and we copy whatever we put in there into a new parameter. If we call by reference, the references of those parameters are given and we actually change the parameters that we're passing in the function. Now, if we are passing an array to a function, and this is what uh, in the current day assignment in, uh, uh, is, is being done, um, in that case, an array itself is a pointer to the first element of the array, as we have seen. So when you pass an array to a function, what you're doing is actually not passing uh, by value, but you are passing by reference, because you are passing a pointer, not an actual integer or a character or whatever. Right. Now, the, the thing to, um, to watch, however, is that you should never return a reference to a local variable. Um, so if you have a function, um, in that case, that uh, uh, function is called here the function one, which for instance creates a cat instance called Frisky, and we return this um, with the reference, then this is really, really dangerous because as soon as this function is returned, whatever we created here, it's similar to um, using the new keyword over here, then whatever we created here is completely lost. Um, and we go out of scope and we cannot access this anymore. So whatever is being returned here is called a dangling reference, similar to how we called the pointers that are pointing to something that we didn't mean to point to a dangling pointer. Right. So one of the problems then is that we, uh, uh, we can return, for instance, to an object on the heap. This is what I just... Uh, uh, this describes. So we have, for instance, a pointer uh, to a cat object, which we immediately create as well, and then we return this pointer as a reference. This is the, the result of a function. Now the question is, how do we delete these objects? Well, in that case, um, if we use this, for instance, in a main function, we can have this such, where we create a reference to an object of uh, type cat. This is immediately the, uh, um, filled in with the return of what uh, the function to returns. Now the question, however, is then if we have a pointer to the cat, which we assign to this, and we delete this pointer, then in that case, our cat object is completely gone. The question that uh, remains then is what happens to my cat? My cat still exists over here, but it's actually a dangling reference 
something that can actually hurt the, the program later. So, so that is a dangerous situation. So the lesson we learned from this is that we better never return objects that were created inside a function. So a function should not create something and return that. Um, this is usually bad practice. The better way to do this is let the caller create those objects, the color of the function, and then pass those objects that were created by, for instance, in the main function, and pass them by a reference as a parameter um, of the function. This makes sure that you don't create things in a function, and as soon as that function uh, ceases to exist, things get lost, for instance. And the final thing I wanted to show today is the this pointer. Now, each time you create an object of a certain class, um, you automatically get for free the this pointer. And the this pointer can be used in certain situations when you don't want to, uh, or when you want to, for instance, be brief. We've already seen this, that if you, for instance, have uh, a method for a cat or also in the constructor, you want to often say uh, the cat has something like its weight. Um, and if you want to, for instance, here pass a variable and its weight is such a nice variable to use, you could also say here its weight. In that case, you have exactly this, the, na the same variable name here as you would have as a data member from a um, data member of, uh, of class cat. Now, in that case, you can distinguish this by saying this which is a pointer to the current object, so therefore we have to use this operator, its weight equals, and then we could use ws here, but we could just as easily um, call this its weight. To distinguish whatever is being passed here, which is a completely different variable than the data member its weight that belongs to the cat, uh, to the cat class. Okay. So the reason for this is to make explicit what we are meaning if we want to, for instance, address, address a certain data member of a class. And this is exactly what I've said before. This is, I think, the most useful and also the uh, most used case. If you really think that its weight is the best name you can give to a variable, either as a parameter of a certain member function or as a data member in your class, then you can use that same name twice. This being exact or completely different from this one over here. And to make that distinction, we can use the this pointer to say this data member that belongs to our cat is the thing that we address here, that we assign the value of this function parameter that has by accident the same name. So in that case, if this name is really poignant and really well chosen, we can use it twice in this case, once for the data member of the class and once for this particular function over here. 